So this afternoon we have Josh from Preston. Josh has been coming to our Preston Raspberry Jams for seven or eight years. Um, and it's incredible being watching Josh's journey over these last few years. Josh, you're going to spend about half an hour giving us a, a learning experience around the block. So go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I've, well, I've not designed the workshop. So, um, if you know someone called, uh, Les Pounder, um, you probably do know him. Uh, he was, he is a writer as a day job and he has written an edge of curriculum, which will be being released next week. Um, and the idea of this is just to give people an introduction as to what Edgebox is and hopefully give you something to do. So um, it's designed as a workshop. So the idea is that you can join in. So what you'll want to do is you will want to go to edgebox.org. So if I put the link in the chat, it's probably best. So if you go to that link there, which is edgebox.org, uh, you will see this website here with like the bluey purple background. Um, and the idea of Edgeblocks is it's a tool to help people who want to move from blocks, so mainly Scratch or MakeCode, into a text-based programming language uh, like Python. Um, and Edgeblocks has been around for about three years. Uh, no, not three years, about four years. Um, and recently in the past year, uh, I had developed it so that people can use it on any device. So it used to just be for the Raspberry Pi, but now you can use it on any device and hopefully uh, you can join in on whatever device you're using today. So once you get to this screen, if you press the start creating button, you will get to a screen that looks like this. So Edgebox has a few different modes. The one we'll be using is Python 3. Um, so if you wanted to go away from this workshop and use something like the Raspberry Pi Microbit or a circuit Python device by Adafruit, you can also do that. So once you get to this screen, you can press select and you get a editor that looks like this with your block toolbar on the left, um, a file name at the top, and then some buttons at the top here to save and run your code. Um, so if I go into the presentation, so what we will be doing today is using a library in Python called Turtle. And what Turtle is, is it's simply a way to draw with Python. And the, the reason I really like Turtle is it provides a really good visual way to learn with Python. Um, now, Python, for some people who have come from scratch, can be quite boring um, because they're faced with just a text-based um, program language rather than a cat with a stage where you can draw stuff and make games. Um, but what Turtle does is it allows you to have this kind of um, scratch-like interface that you are used to, but in a Python environment. So. Uh, Turtle, just a bit as a bit of an origin, um, was created as part of Logo, which was created in 1967. And basically what it was, is it was a robot that would draw patterns on paper. And what Turtle is, it's a Python way of emulating what that robot would do on the paper, but on the screen. Uh, and it's really simple to use. Uh, so with Turtle, we can create a sequence uh, of code in Python and see an image, uh, and we can use different loops to make patterns. So there are a few coding concepts um, there that I've just mentioned. So we've done that. Uh, you should get to the Python editor here. Um, okay, so let's start by creating some code. So. The first block of code that we need is in this turtle menu here. So it's turtle import. So we need to import the turtle library so that we have something to work with so we can reference all of these functions within turtle. 
The next one is we need to initialize turtle. So we need to initialize the actual turtle drawing um, pen, if you will. And then the next one is initialize the turtle screen. So turtle has a canvas, so like a canvas in art, uh, and that initializes that canvas of which we can draw on. So once we've got all that sorted, uh, they, they are our um, initial um, ishina, initialization blocks. So let's try and draw a square. So very simply, um, let's try and draw a square. So the code that we want to add is a forward 90. So if we do forward and then 90, and then the next one is left 90. So you can just right click on that one, duplicate it, drag it underneath and then change forward to left. And then we want another forward 90. And then another left 90. Okay. So that's what that uh, piece of code does. Now, if I just leave that up for uh, 20 seconds so that you can copy that. Then if I try and run it, so it's forward, left, forward, left. We can see that that draws the first part of the square. So how can we adapt that to further create a square? So let's see if you can take this code here and then turn it into a square. So can anyone suggest in the chat what we might add to this code to complete the square? So let's wait for some replies. So Simon's suggesting if we could do it with a loop. Repeat with a loop. So there are a few ways that we could do it. So we could basically add two of these uh, and then another two like that, and press run and that would complete the square, but you can see that there's quite a lot of blocks here and that's not really necessary. So what we can do is we can use something called a loop. So that's the next slide. So you can see that we can cut this code down into just a few blocks using something called iteration. And basically, if you look here, you can see that these two blocks are just repeated four times and that's not really necessary. So what we could do is if we remove these blocks here, so we're just left with these two. Go into loops and then get this four iron range number and then put that around those two blocks, change that to four. And if we run it, you can see that it'll do exactly the same thing. So that's using a loop to cut down our code. Now, if you're using something called the, uh, something like the micro bit, which only has a very limited amount of space, uh, using loops can be quite good because you can actually fit in more code uh, because the microbit only has a limited amount of space. You can fit in more code to do more things by using loops and little tricks like this um, to fit it on that uh, small space. So we can use this loop to um, do that. Now, how do we draw a different shape? So let's try and draw a triangle. So draw a triangle. What we can do is we can change this loop to three, forward 100. And then here, what do we think we should put there? So can anyone suggest what we can do to put there to make a triangle? I think it's already showed up on the, um, Green. So Gary, is, Gary and Tracy has uh, suggested 120. So should we try that? Are we continuing with left? Yeah, there we go. That creates our triangle. 
So Simon said 60, so I wonder what 60 is. That, that creates another shape there, so half a hexagon. So that is uh, how we can use loops. So this is um, kind of a way to um, remember it. So the turning angle, uh, we can do that by dividing 360 uh, by the number of sides the shape has. Um, so that's quite a handy thing to know. Now, how can we make something a little bit more interesting? So you can see that we've got squares and triangles, but that can be quite boring. So let's try and draw a pattern. So if we go back to our editor here, and then remove that bit of code there. So to create a pattern, what we can do is if we get a wild truth, that's similar to a, um, a forever loop in Scratch, I think is what it's called. Um, and then if we get another for I range loop, and then if we change that to three, and then go into turtle, get a forward block, change that to 50, get a left, I keep clicking on the wrong thing, change that to 120, and then add right at the bottom there. And then change that to 10, and if we run that, that we start to get a pattern. So you can see how we can quickly change our code to do more interesting things than just drawing squares and triangles. So that is simple to do. So each time the loop iterates, we move the turtle by 10 pixels, which instead of just drawing the triangle over each other, it will create this pattern effect like that. Now, you can see that um, we've got a pattern and we have um, just a black pen color. How can we change that pen color? So that's quite easy to do. So there are a few things that we can do to change our code here. So in Turtle, there are a few blocks that we can use to change things up a bit. So we can change the speed. So we can change that to speed 100 or you can change that to speed zero if you want it to be really quick. Uh, we can change the pen color like this to red, uh, and we can change the width to, let's say, 20. So there are a few things um, that we can change the color to. So if I just highlight this here, so in, Turtle, we use what are called RGB values, so red, green, and blue. So each value has three numbers, and they go from 0 to 200, 255, and you can change those to create different colors. So some examples are if you want to create red, then you put 255 in the first number. If you want green, then you put it in the second number, and then 255 in the last number to make blue. And you can mix those up, so you could do 255 on the first number, then 0, and then 255 on blue to make purple. Um, so if we try and run that code now, we can see that that makes um, a pattern like that. And um, because the width is 20, it kind of covers up all of those gaps. So let's try changing that to 10 we see that we have a little bit more of a gap there. And if we change it to maybe five, see that's a bit more, that's a bit better. So here is a challenge. Um, how can we get it so that it changes the pen color on each um, triangle? Can okay, anyone suggest what we might do there?
I'll just wait for someone to say what we could do in the chat. So if we wanted to change the pen color on each individual triangle. So Scott has suggested add variables for RGB and add a value to those values on each run around the loop. Yes, yeah, so that's one way we could do it. So if I open up a sample uh, here, um, oh, that's a good suggestion. So a random command. So actually, before I go into the next bit, if we create a list of um, some colors, um, now, the good thing about uh, turtle is that, um, just rename that to colors, is that you don't actually have to suggest RGB values. What you could do is um, you can just put quotes, red, yellow, and it's got pre programmed colors, so green, blue. Obviously, you can't put colors that no one's ever heard of in there, um, else it won't know what to do. So if we do turtle.pencolor, uh, change this a bit so that we have colors there, pen color, and then get random uh, choice, uh, and then Colors, the widths, then duplicate that there again, like that. So hopefully that should then. Oh, random is not defined. That's um, a mistake that I forgot. So we import random, and we can see that that now changes the color each time that we have a new triangle. So. That is a quick example of how we can change a bit. One of the other things that we can change is um, the background color if we want to. So, for example, if we do uh, a, back, a black background, you see that you can change that like that. So that is, oh, I don't want to do that. Right, so that is a quick example of how we can change a few things there. So, now that we have learned how to um, create a pattern, I'm going to set everyone a quick challenge. Um, so, if I leave this up here, so that people can copy the code, um, what I want you to do is see what you can change, see what you can add with the turtle library, with what I've already got as some code here, and try and make your own pattern. So if I leave this code up here so that people can copy that down and change it, if I give people about seven minutes till about half past and see what they can create, um, that, I think that would be a good idea. So Simon says, how do we copy it? So um, you should be able to see um, the code on the screen. Does that not show up? We can see the code on the screen. I think, I mean, there are a couple of people are saying at the moment, oh, slow down. And just bear in mind that all of this yeah. is recorded. So within yeah. an hour or two of the event finishing, we'll automatically have a recording on there that you can go back. Um, I mean, Josh, it might be worth, when you're doing some of the bits to try to zoom in just on certain blocks okay of yeah. i realized sometimes it's nice to be able to see all of us at the same time okay um yeah. so would it be a good idea just to, for me to explain what everyone what everything does first before people try and make their own thing um so if i just zoom in here so um i went through the imports at the top so this imports random and turtle um the third one initializes turtle so the actual pen um, and then the fourth one in, initializes canvas um, this block here changes the speed 
So zero is the fastest speed, uh, even though that probably doesn't make sense. Um, colors is just a list. So I've just put some quotation marks here and then put a comma and then another color. And you can choose some very basic colors to put there. Um, this just changes the pen color. And what this block here does um, is it chooses a random color from this list. So you can see that those two match up there. This changes the canvas color, so the background color. So I just selected black there. Uh, but you can change that to um, an RGB value if you wanted. So um, if I run that, I'll go back to it in a minute. See that that changes it to purple. Uh, so that changes the background color. That changes how uh, that changes the width of the pen. Uh, this is a forever loop. So anything inside of this uh, loop that is highlighted in uh, not yellow um, will run all of the time. This block here, so the two blocks inside of this for loop will run three times. Uh, and it will go forward, and then it will turn left um, by 120 degrees, because that's how we make a triangle. What you could do here, you change that, that will make a, a square, so you can do a different pattern like that. So what you do, if you want a different shape, you find out how many sides it has, and then divide that by four. Um, right will um, move the pen by 10, uh, so that's how we create a pattern instead of it just going over each other. So you can see that changing it to 20 does something a little bit different. And then this just changes the pen colour when we go around the loop again. So um, if I lead that up, hopefully people can see it. Um, if you can't see it, what I'll do is I'll save the file and I'll put it in a Google Drive link for you to download. Um, and yeah, so I'll put it in a Google Drive link for you to download and then you can just press open there if you can't see the screen very well, if you want to change things up a bit. So I'll put that in the chat now, but I'll leave that up if you want to create your own pattern uh, for the next five minutes and we'll see what people can create. And if you've, got, if you've got one that you want to show, um, you can quickly post it on Twitter or something, or you can quickly share your screen um, after the five minutes is over. So I'll just let people have a go with that now. So I've put um, the Google Drive link to the file that I've got up here if you want to download and open that. So it's just an XML file. Uh, so when you click on that, uh, you should see a little download icon uh, and you can download and open that. So Andrew's posted an error. Um, one of the things that I might suggest with that, um, I can't remember, but I have seen something similar to that before. Um, it might be that uh, if you're choosing, um, if you're doing, uh, if you're indexing a loop uh, via the, I'm just trying to figure out the best way to explain it. So that say you've got five items in the list and um, you're referencing that list somewhere else, uh, 
and it's like a, a for loop and it's trying to find a six item, it might throw that error, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, like Martin said, we'd have to see the code for us to kind of figure it out. We should have some background music playing so people know that we're still broadcasting. So Josh has set a problem for people to try to solve. So just um, if I just show Andrew very quickly. Uh, so you see this blocks button here next under run. If you click that, then you get the Python view. And if you just copy and paste that, I can have a look at it. So for some reason, um, on Andrew's code, it looks like there's no equal sign in between colours and the um, square bracket for the list. Uh, I think that's probably what that is. So I don't know how you've got to that. So if you look on mine, in between colours and red, there's an equal sign. Um, so that might be an issue. So Simon says he's changed the width randomly. Does Simon want to share his screen so that people can see what he's done? We're just waiting to see if Simon can do a screen share so we can have a look at what Simon's been working on. I think he's gone off. Um, okay. maybe, maybe it's not working for him or something. I'll Are just for another minute or two, maybe because I'm I'm supposed to start at 340 with this. Graphic yeah. Work. Oh, who's this? In? Oh, it was you. Okay. See, so, oh, Simon's come back now. Uh, does Simon want to take it over again? Okay. It's all right. I think Simon's posted his to Twitter, I think. Um, I got a notification for something. I could probably show it that way. Does anyone else have something that they want to show uh, before we move on?
So as people are talking in the chat, um, one thing um, that would be worth pointing out is if you want something similar to Turtle that's a bit more advanced, uh, if I just duplicate this so that I don't get rid of that code, um, then you can go into samples and then click on processing. And processing is a bit more advanced, but it's a bit different. Um, you see this is like a, a similar thing to Scratch where you get the cat to follow the mouse. Um, so it's a similar example to that. So Python can emulate things like Scratch. It's just a, uh, a bit of a different language to learn. Uh, but you can see that um, something similar does exist. So uh, if I bring up the uh, presentation again, which I have now lost, I think. Um, so if you wanted an example pattern, um, that would be something similar there. Uh, and what that draws is um, it draws something like this. So very similar to what uh, I did, um, but just with a few more bits and pieces in there. Um, there's other things that you can draw as well with Turtle, like a circle, which is turtle.circle. Um, so you can see here that it's just a turtle pattern uh, to draw a similar pattern, but with a different shape. So there's all sorts of different shapes that you can draw um, as well in there. Oh, Simon's posted his uh, thing here, if I can bring that up. So you can see that uh, the width has randomly changed, so it's not just all the same. And uh, the background's changed as well. That's cool. So just to recap what we've learned, um, we've learned how to use sequences um, to control turtle, um, learn how to use the different loops, so like a while true loop and a for loop, and also some maths as well to create the different shapes. So that is it for me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and learned something. Uh, these um, workshops, lessons will be on the Agebox website next week uh, if you want to access them afterwards. Uh, but I hope you found it useful. So I think it's over to Alan now. Okay, thank you very much, Josh. So um, I don't know if anybody's planning to leave us right now. I'm, I'm not. I'm hoping to do a presentation in a moment, a workshop. But if you are, please make sure to give us some feedback, please. So I'm just going to the URL. Um, right. Um, I've been having some problems with the internet at, at this afternoon, and I'm parked at the bottom of a, of a mobile mast. And I've noticed for some reason, I don't know why the signal keeps going on and then off. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plow on and see how things go. Um, I'm going to switch on my camera. So that should start sharing in a moment. I'm actually sat in my car um, in a technology park near where I live. And now I'm planning to go over to screen share now. So uh, I have lots of different. I just need to, there we are, okay. So as I'm sure uh, many of us at the moment are trying to get a bit more used to working at home and, and, and one of the things we're trying this afternoon is we do ideas for our workshop this afternoon. And it's it's really about how you might if you've never used Scratch before, how you might start, or if there's a, a somebody that is new to programming, you might decide that you're going to start them on Scratch, and whether that's a son, daughter, colleague, spouse, parent, or whatever. Now, if you if you decided you were going to learn programming with Scratch, then you, there's a few different approaches that you might go down. Um, you you could go to a search engine and you could say like, for example, I want to make a Pac-Man game. So how would I make a Pac-Man game in Scratch? And there's YouTube videos you can follow. You'll find there's lots of worksheets and um, books and all sorts of articles and things, which is one way. And it's 
um, it's not always the best, I would say. It, it's perhaps not as much fun because you're following somebody else's instructions in order to build something. But it's a good way to start. I'm going to suggest there's another thing you could do. So I'm on the Scratch website at the moment, the, the search bar. And I could go to the search bar and I could type something in. Um, so earlier I did a search for Pac-Man. And there's quite a few Pac-Man games all run already on Scratch. And we could type in Pac-Man and you might find that that comes up with even more different versions. And these are all different Pac-Man games and made by different users. Some of them might be very, very young and inexperienced. And some of them might be very, very slick examples. And I found one here. And I'm just going to start playing this for a moment. Now, it might be quite noisy when I go to click on play. So to click on play, to try this one, I would click on the green flag. And I can hear some music. It's telling me to press the space bar. And I'm just going to go full screen for a moment. And I'm just going to see, how is that going to work? That should be OK on in here. So here we go, space, space bar. Now, I'm not very good at playing Pac-Man, but this one looks pretty much like if you were playing Pac-Man. Oh, except that it's got some glitches and things. Now, I'm going to press the stop button. And I'm going to resize the screen. So um, one thing, if you decide, oh, I'm going to make a certain game, then um, you might decide that you're going to try to start with an example of one that somebody else has already created. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good place to start with something like that. Now, one of the nice things about Scratch is when people share their games on Scratch, you can, if you log in, you can remix those. So it's like saying, take somebody else's game and save a copy of it. The other thing you can do is you can see what's inside them. So let's have a look inside. Now, I remember sometimes in my life, I've wanted to learn how something works and I've got a screwdriver out and I've popped the lid or the cover off. And that's not always a good thing. You might look inside and think, oh my gosh, I haven't got an absolute clue about what's going on here. But still, you might think, oh, let's tinker, let's change this, the value of this, or let's change this thing here, or let's delete this thing here, or change this message. So it's another kind of way that you can learn so, so far, I've suggested that you might go and follow tutorials, YouTube, worksheets. I suggested that you might find somebody else's project and modify that project and see how that looks. And, but I'm going to suggest another approach now, which is just start right from the beginning. And over the next half hour or so, that's what I'm planning that I'm going to do. Now, this is a bit strange. I've never taught a lesson sat in the car seat of my car at the moment. And I might invite Josh or Gary or Martin. If you were to switch on your microphone as I'm going along, if things go wrong, you might shout something at me. So um, I'm on the Scratch website, scratch.mit.edu, and I'm going to click on Create. Now, I've tried this approach lots of different times, and I forget from time to time which is the best way. So it's this is a, like a suck it and see kind of approach. So the first thing I'm going to do is when my Scratch uh, interface or environment loads up, it, does, it usually is a bit faster than this. When it loads up, you're nearly always presented with a screen that has the cat in, some sprites down here in the bottom right hand corner. Over here on the left, I have all of these different blocks that I can use. And then I have the coding area. Now, I'm going to try and go through this fairly quickly. Um, I realize I'm kind of five minutes in, and I want to see how far we can go this afternoon. It might be something that we'll come back at another time. Now, pretty much every Scratch game has got two or three key components. You have your uh, characters, which we will call sprites. You have a background, and then you have code blocks. Now, you might add in sounds and animations and other things. And I'm going to start off, and I'm going to create a Pac-Man character. So you can you could go and find a Pac-Man character and upload that to it. But I would suggest the very first time you do this, just have a have a go at using some of the paint tools. Now I'm using the latest version of Scratch and it's running online at the moment. So my computer's probably doing a lot more than it's used to do. And I'm I'm connected over a mobile device. Um, I'm broadcasting my camera. I'm doing some online conferencing. I'm using so I'm, there's quite a lot going on, and we'll see how that well that works. 
Now, what I'm going to do is I want to create my Pac-Man character. Now, a few times when I've done this, I've learned it's best to start with a circle. And I want a circle that's going to have no outline. And I'm going to go for, for the conventional kind of yellow colored Pac-Man. Of course, you could have a pink man or a punk man or decide whatever it is that you want to do. And I'm just tinkering with these controls here so I can get the, the color fill that I want for my Pac-Man. And I'm going to now draw a large circle object uh, to represent Pac-Man's body. Now, I'm going to do the same thing again, but this time I'm going to click off the object I've created and I'm going to just try to go for a black color. And I'm now going to add in an eye. Now, Pac, you could give Pac-Man a rounded eye. You could give him sort of a, an oval, elliptical kind of eye. And now the next thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to give Pac-Man a mouth that looks like it's open. And the simplest way often is just to use an eraser or a rubber. And I'm just going to rub out just a small amount of that. And when I let go, you can see that part has disappeared. Now I'm just going to take a peek back at the big blue button and see what's going on at the moment. Now, nobody's typing anything in the chat at the moment. So I presume you can all hear me. You can see everything. And if you can't, maybe... Somebody will message me or something. So I've created the, the first beginnings of my sprite. Now, I'm going to jump ahead just to another step. So one of the things that you might have noticed, when we played one of the Pac-Man games before, um, the Pac-Man was animated when we were playing the game. It looked like Pac-Man was opening and closing his mouth. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to try to do something similar. Now, one really nice, easy way of doing that is just to duplicate a costume just shut the windows and the car's getting a bit breezy uh, and i'm going to so here i can see my costume and i'm going to do a right click on there and duplicate and i'm just going to alter this costume slightly and i'm going to use the eraser again and i'm going to open pac-man's mouth just a little bit more and i'm going to make the eraser a little bit larger so i can create a more dramatic open effect and this time um I, now you could probably say i should maybe be moving his eye, because as his mouth opens, so is that the position of his eye might move back further as well. So I've now got two costumes for, for my sprite. And as I alter between the two, you can see we're kind of getting that effect that his mouth is opening and closing. Now, I'm gonna go back to the code. And the first thing I'm gonna do now, after having created that, is I'm going to have him scroll through his costumes. Now, in this newer version of Scratch, all of the icons, the different groups, you can just scroll through them or you can click on certain blocks to get to where you want. Now, if I go to the looks palette within there, I have a block that says next costume. Now, what I can do with this block, and I'm going to zoom in just to make it easier for you to see what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, I can go in even larger again. Okay. Now, um, if I double click on this block now, it should mom, model or mimic what should happen. So if I click on double block, double the, okay. So maybe I just need to click once. Ah, so I just click once. So a double click makes it do it twice. So there we are. Now, I would like to make it so it does this automatically. So I'm gonna ask you if you, you've probably seen this kind of thing before, you've probably got your own ideas. I'm going to add one or two more blocks now so that when I click on the green flag, Pac-Man will automatically open and close his mouth in a smooth way. And I'm going to start that in about one minute. But if you're watching and we're recording this and anything you type will appear in the in the recording, could you now use your keyboard and type in two, three or four blocks that you think you would use now so that Pac-Man automatically opens and closes his mouth in a smooth manner. And I'm just going to go and see that you are typing things. Yeah, and I can see you're doing that. Now, one of the things about Scratch is it's meant to be creative. It's a very nice creative computing tool. And you will invariably find that there is more than one way of making something happen in Scratch. So if I demonstrate how I would do it, it might be on another day I would do it very different. It might be that I noticed some of them called Mark. Mark might do it a different way. So there's no right and wrong way. I'm just showing you some different ways of doing it. 
So I'm going to go to the events menu and in the events menu at the top, I have a block. Now, pause in a moment. Now, I've just intersected those two blocks together. Now, if you've ever used block uh, scratch before, you might not have realized that when blocks get within a proximity, they snap automatically to each other. Sometimes it's a bit annoying because I didn't actually intend for them to join before, but I'd forgotten I'd zoomed in, so that so they're a little bit more sensitive. So when I click on the green flag now, each time I start this particular program, any scripts that have got a green flag at the top, they will start as well. Now, if I want to do this in a smooth manner and do it automatically, so I don't have to keep clicking on the flag, and that's a bit of a tongue twister, <laughs> um, you'll find if you scroll through, there are some control blocks that will allow you to do this in an automatic way. And forever is, is, is one way of doing that. Now, what will happen now, in fact, I could ask you, I could pause now and I could say, when I click on the green flag, what do you think will happen? And uh, you might already have an answer in your head. You might type the answer in the chat just now and I'm gonna go and have a look and see how things are going in the chat. <laughs> okay, now, so, um apologies i'm having lots of issues with my connectivity this afternoon but i'm just gonna plunder on regardless and see how this goes so um i'm gonna click on the green flag now now sometimes people will say oh pac-man will open and close his mouth sometimes people say oh it'll do it so quickly that it, you won't even see it some will say, so here we go we click on the green flag and it's doing it pretty quickly um it's probably doing trying to do a few hundred in a second or so and uh, and I'm going to stop that. So uh, a more desirable way of controlling that would be to put a time delay in. So we could have a one second time delay and we could see how that looks. So let's try that. And I click on the green flag and it's a bit too long. So what we can do is we can do fractions of seconds, but, but we couldn't type in like one over two. So we could, if we want to go for half a second, we could type in 0.5. And then it, it usually will automatically convert that to 0 0.5. And I click on start again. And it's a little bit faster. Let's go for something a lot smaller. Let's put, try 0 0.2. So a fifth of a second. I click on the green flag. Um, so maybe if you ever played the Pac-Man game, that's a little bit more like you might see in the game. So um, I don't have to do anything else at the moment in terms of the animation. The Pac-Man will automatically open. Now, if I had a child sat here with me in the car, a younger learner, maybe an eight year old, I might be saying to that child, so, OK, uh, what should we do next? And they would probably say something like, let's make the Pac-Man move on the screen. Now, I would probably say to that child, oh, yeah, but have you noticed um, I can actually click on the Pac-Man just for a moment? And it looks like the Pac-Man is chewing on the cat now. This game, we didn't intend for this game to have a cat in the game. So I'm just going to click over here and this little bin icon. I'm just going to remove the cat sprite. So we just. They've been patronized. You might say some things like, oh, well, there's not really a lot of space for that. Pac-Man to move around the screen. So should we look to shrink or reduce the size? Now in here, in this palette, I do, in, in, in this option here, I could now just type in the number 10 and that will give me a 10% size of the original, which is probably a little bit too small at the moment, but for the, for the so for the purpose of the demonstration, I'm gonna go for something like 20% for the moment. And also yellow doesn't work remarkably well on a white background. So um, maybe what we should be looking to do now is to change the background so it looks a bit like if we go back and look at that Pac-Man game before. Look, I mean, that looks, wow. We could probably spend a whole afternoon just making it look like that. So I'm going to go back to my game. Now, because I'm logged in at the moment, you might notice that every time I make certain changes, it automatically saves those. And at the moment, my game is called Untitled 5. I should probably call this something like Pac-Man 20 April 20 or something like that so that later on I can share that with people. In fact, let me just do that. If I click share. Oh, oh, 
what's going on? I want to go back and work on it. But what I could do is I could copy a link to that now. Copy the link. And I could go over to my big blue button software and I could paste that link in to the public chat. And then um, and then people could, if they wanted, they could go and find my game and, and they could like work on that themselves if they wanted. But really, I want to go back now and start working on my game. So, oh, no, do I? And it doesn't matter if you forget or don't know. We can, there's a sort of suck it and see kind of thing. So I can go back and click, oh, and I clicked on C inside and I'm now back in it. Now, in the new version of Scratch, so I'm saying new, this is this has been out for about, uh, it's about six to seven months now, I think that this version has been available as, as it is. Um, Something changed to do with the backgrounds and, and the wallpaper. And this is this catches me out a little bit. If you want to change the wallpaper or the background of Scratch, you have to do this thing with your mouse where you kind of slide everything over to the right. I'll just do that again. So with my mouse, I'm sliding everything. And have you noticed how the colors of the palettes have disappeared? So I'll just do it again, slide back. Oh. I actually have to come over here to do it. So look, I can see all the colors of the different palettes and I've come over here and that's just a bit new and I'm only just about getting used to it. So I'm gonna create a new backdrop. Now these used to be called wallpapers and backgrounds and costumes. So they, they change the word in here. So I'm gonna create a new backdrop and just for the sake of simplicity at the moment, I'm just gonna the bucket tool and fill that in what i actually have to do is i have to create an object like a rectangle and then i can fill in the background something like that okay oh i didn't want that so now it's starting to look a little bit more like i'd intended so i'm going to now go back to my code so um now at this point people will often say oh my gosh what's happened all of my blocks have disappeared and it might be worth noticing that over here it says you have stage selected. There are no motion blocks at this stage. I'm on the stage. So if I click on my sprite, there are my blocks there. So don't be alarmed if things seem to disappear. You've probably not deleted them. You've probably just gone through a different view. Now, the more you do things like this, the more you become familiar and used to these. Now, I'm just going to go and look at the chat. I'm not hearing anybody talking to me, um, so I will just carry on and hope that my internet connection is, is holding true. Now, um, in terms of movement, so I started this at about 3.40, this presentation, and my plan was to make it last for about half an hour. So I think I've got about 10 minutes. So I think over the next 10 minutes, I should be able to incorporate some kind of movement of Pac-Man about the screen, not when I click and drag on him with the mouse, but actually keyboard controls. And I'll probably just have time to add some other things. And it might be if we were doing a jam in the afternoon in a week or two's time, we could pick up the next stage of this. Now, um, so what I want to do is I'm going to create some keyboard controls to create to allow my Pac-Man to move. Now, I'm just going to switch the whole program off for a moment. I'm going to click on the stop so Pac-Man can rest easy with his mouth open. Now, over here in the motion menu, I've got a whole selection of different blocks. Now, people who are listening and paying attention, could you go to the public chat now and type in, if you wanted to move Pac-Man, what would be your particular approach to go to? Um, just see if they send me any messages that I need to be paying attention to. No, that's okay. <laughs> so my question was, if you wanted Pac-Man to move about on the screen using keyboard controls, what would your approach be? Now, the approach that I've tended to go for in the past is, I'll first of all decide, am I going to go down the route of using the X and the Y coordinates? So if I move Pac-Man into the middle of the screen, um, look at X is eight and Y is seven. I could probably, with just a little bit of tweak, and I could probably manage to get Pac-Man somewhere very close. Decide to tell Pac-Man at the very beginning of the game to go to a certain position. In fact, I could have that 
up here. That would work quite nicely. If I could type in X, Y, zero. So that if I move Pac-Man, say over here, and then click the green flag. Oh, Pac-Man starts there at the beginning of the game. I wonder if I want Pac-Man to start here at the beginning of the game. X minus 183, Y minus one. So I want to just change those. So minus 183, whoop, too many. And Y minus 131. So if, if Pac-Man finishes the game over here and I click on the green flag, he starts there. So I want Pac-Man now, if I use keyboard controls to move right and left. Now, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit because I'm going to add a few more blocks. Now, in the, the motion menu, um, I've got a few other options in terms of if I click on the green flag. So there is a block I can use where if I press a certain key, something happens. So I'm going to try select if the right arrow key is pressed, something will happen. So I'm going to go up to the motion menu. And I've decided rather than incrementing or decrementing, decrementing, reducing, whatever, I'm going to go on the number of steps. So I'm going to say Pac-Man. When I press the right arrow key, move 10 steps. So I can test that now. I press the right arrow key. Oh, and that, that's the desired kind of thing that I wanted. But now I've pressed the left arrow key, nothing happens. So a simple way of saving a bit of time, I could just say duplicate that now. So I have a duplicate and I could just swap this over to left arrow blocks. And by the way, I when I join blocks together, I call these a stack. Um, I could say move minus 10 steps. So I could try that now. So I press the left arrow key. It goes backwards, right arrow key. Now just click on the green flag. Um, so I can go, I can go right, I can go left. Okay, so that's one way of, of making Pac-Man move. Now, um, you might have noticed Pac-Man, when he moves backwards, he's not facing that way. So really, I would like Pac-Man, if possible, to face in the opposite direction. So I'm now going to go... And would, would that be in the looks menu? Is there a look backwards, look forwards? No, let's go and look back in the motion menu. Um, is there something, something, something? Oh, this one here says point in direction. Let's see how that looks. So it's over here, point in direction. And I dropped that on there. Now, what's what options have we got? Oh, now there's a little sort of clock arrow kind of thing. So I could say to Pac-Man, look the opposite way and try that so i can go forwards and then i can oh oh there's something really strange going on here now ah okay now this is useful if you were doing this with a person and you're trying to teach and lead somebody through um i'm just having a look at your messages in the comments of the public chat um I'm trying to do a little bit of debugging as I'm going along and thinking, oh, hang on. So I've managed to get it to face that direction, but now it's going the opposite way from how I intended. And I suppose this comes down to how the move steps block works. So move a number of steps will move that number in the direction you're pointing. So really now this should be move and it's now moving but it but he looks upside down and that wasn't really what i wanted so i'm going to go back to this direction menu here and see um well that, that that's correct now i do know how to do this but i'm trying to uh for viewers at home try to do it in a way that suggests i might not know now look at the bottom of here there's three little icons here and one is blue and the other two are gray so um Ah, okay, so it now says on my screen, all around, what does the next one say? Left and right, and then the one after that says, do not rotate. Well, let's try the next one. Oh, okay, so let me try that again. So I'm pressing on the right arrow. Oh, of course, I don't have a point in direction. So um, now, there, I know there's some people, when they try this particular approach that I'm going for, this is a suck it and see and try it. Some people, this drives them crazy because they get really annoyed. They really get frustrated and they kind of, they would want to give up at this point. But
although the, le the learning curve is extremely steep, you might find that actually um, when you do figure things out, you have these kind of aha moments that like, like yes, they're more of a eureka than a, an aha. So right arrow key, I'm tapping the right arrow key. Now I tap the left arrow key. Ah, oh, and now I've managed to make the Pac-Man do something more like I would like it to do. Now, of course, if we go back and look at the versions of the Pac-Man game, uh, there was one earlier. And if I just go full screen on this one now and click on the green flag um, and press the space bar again, watch in this Pac-Man game, you only have to press the left arrow key once, the right arrow key, and Pac-Man automatically moves forward until, of course, he dies. I'm not very good at playing Pac-Man. So um, we could say that this Pac-Man here is not perfect yet, but it's different. It's better, perhaps, because it's a Pac-Man that we've built. Now, I'm planning to stop this presentation, this workshop, in the next two or three minutes. But I would like to ask... Um, people who are still watching and who haven't fallen asleep, if you had got to this stage yourself, objective or particular like little problem that you think, if you were going to build something that would be like a full blown out Pac-Man, what would it be that you would be looking to work on next? So, if you like, if you've got to this stage today, you've got a Pac-Man that will turn right, turn left, and can move forward and backwards. What would be your next little challenge to add into the game? Um, and I'm looking over to the chat. Um, so we've got a maze, up and down movement, um, and uh, lots of helpful com comments there going on in the chat. The dots. Now, um, one of the things about a game, if you really want to sustain people's interest, huh, you need to add a little bit of a challenge, not for the creator necessarily, because there's lots of challenges, but for the player, the, the, the game user or the game player. So having little objects in there for the Pac-Man to eat. So um, I am going to be stopping this workshop in the next minute or two. But uh, what I would do now is I would suggest that what you might consider is if you were going to add in a sprite for some pills, you might choose a different color from black, something that's going to stand out in the game. There might be yellow pills, there might be white pills. It, it, you know, it, you could vary the game. You could be sort of matrix inspired with a red pill and a blue pill. Um, and then, so I'm just creating a pill. So it's a white pill and a white background. And obviously we have a scale issue there, so we can sort that out in a moment. And I'm going to go back to the game. And in the size, let me try 10. How does that look if I change that to 10? Oh, no. And I could put this down here in front of Pac Man. And I would say, if you're going to, if this is a project that you're going to try at home later on, don't start to go, oh, all my scripts have gone. They've all disappeared. Because remember, if you look over here, at the moment, we have the pale sprite selected. We should really. Go back. So you might decide now to create some code blocks. And in, if you look in the looks menu, I'm going to give you a few clues as to what you might use. So there are some blocks that say show. There's some that say hide. In the sensing menu, you've got some blocks that say things like if I'm touching a certain thing, if I'm touching a certain object. So I could say if we're touching. What else? Have we, oh, we could have if something is touching something, we could look at putting some way around these together. We could have like a show if something is touching something then we could make the pill hide. We could have a score. Now, um, that's about it for me. Now, this afternoon, we said in our jam this afternoon, we were going to have two workshops. So we had the first workshop with Josh, who was demonstrating the edgy blocks. Just had the second one from me, Alan, showing how to go about making a Pac-Man in Scratch. Um, it would be nice if you're going to come back and join us in a in a week or two, in another one maybe of these afternoon jams for you to share with us a project that you've worked on. Uh, you might recognize some people in the chat. Um, but now I'm going to be hand the microphone over to 
Martin, and Martin is going to be speaking to us about 2004. So, Martin, I'm going to try, if you haven't done so already, to make you the presenter. When Alan um, advertised this for Azerbaijan, he advertised it with a theme of 2004. So I thought I'd actually talk about 2004 and what was going on on the Internet uh, back then. Um, so when the internet at 2003 was relatively slow, it was modems. Um, so we we're getting like 56k as our connection speeds. But 2004, we started getting broadband as a popular thing. And we started getting broadband being popular and being cheap enough that people could actually have it. So we were having broadband for £18 a month, when broadband meant it was 512 kilobits per second, um, which was fairly good uh, at the time. We did get things like kind of articles like this saying that, you know, broadband has soared. We've actually got a much better connection speed in 2004 than we have previously. And we had um, the key statistics back then was that like 60% of uh, people or 60% of homes had PCs. 50% um, of homes had internet access. There was 3.2 million broadband connections. So there was basically an, an explosion or the start of the explosion of the amount of broadband, the amount of home computers that were being used. To put the um, broadband in perspective, what I've got there is three lines. So the first line represents kind of the 90s and the early 2000s and the internet connection speeds we had back then, 56, uh, sorry, 57 kilobits per second. Then proportionally the 2004 connection speeds at about half a megabit per second, so the 512 megabit, uh, sorry, kilobits per second. And then comparing it to uh, what I managed to find out was the broadband speeds or the average broadband speeds for now, which is 29 megabits per second. Of course, lots of people have much better broadband than that. Uh, lots of people have a lot much worse broadband than that. I'm assuming Alan has much worse broadband than that at the moment, uh, especially sat in a car. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is quite worrying, Alan. Um, so those speeds, so the actual, the 2004 speeds, um, there was stuff going on kind of at the time. People were downloading MP3s, people were trying to download software. So what I've got there is a graph that shows in minutes how long it takes to download an average MP3 from a 56K modem, a 57K modem, be in the 90s in 2004 and currently. So in the 90s, it took about an hour to download an MP3. Um, so it was something you had to really want in order to be able to bother to download something like that. But in 2004, when we hit the half megabit per second, you could have decided you wanted to listen to a song, downloaded the song, and be listening to it within 10 minutes. Now that was massive that was really impressive for the time and that led to kind of an explosion of people downloading music listening to music um, illegally effectively what then happened was that the recording industry uh, basically started suing lots of people so they started suing people who had their IP address, so their home computer, associated with downloading music files. They would go off and download, sorry, and sue pretty much everybody or anybody they could find. So you'd get court cases where they would be talking about um, things like grandmothers had downloaded 10,000 songs. Um, and it would turn out it was actually a grandchild somewhere, but they'd still take the grandmother to court rather than the actual person that was the problem. Um, 
during the, the 2004 as well, something else became useful. Oops, I should. Uh, something else became possible. So what I've got there is the amount of time it would take to download a DVD. So during the 90s, it was 12,500 minutes. That's about 208 hours or nearly nine days. So if you're going to download a film during the 90s, it would be well over a week in order to do that. And in the UK, we actually paid for our internet calls. We actually paid to use a modem to connect to our internet per minute. So back in the 90s and early 2000s, it was just cheaper to go and buy the DVD or the VHS, depending on how far uh, back into the 90s we were. But by 2004, by the time we had these broadband connections, we're now on just uh, under 24 hours. So you could have a new movie downloaded to your computer within a day. What happened was that people would go out and record movies. They'd go out and record movies in cinemas using uh, video cameras. So smartphones weren't a thing, uh, not a reliable, good, high quality camera in a smartphone anyway. So people would take video cameras, they would sit in um, movie theatres, they would record the movie and they would release it online so that people could download it and people could watch. And you'd get competitions between different groups of people who were trying to be the first to actually get a copy of a new release of a film out on the internet. Um, and again, for context, I've put our 2020 numbers there, which is 24 minutes in order to download a film and be able to watch it. So less time than it takes to actually watch the film. There was also some other things going on that were quite useful as well. So what you should see there is a nice fuzzy picture. Uh, that is intentional. That isn't a dodgy network connection on my part. Um, in 2004, there was a codec released and the codec is the thing that compresses the video and makes it viewable, makes it either a lossless codec so you can compress and get as much information into it and have a high quality. So before 2004, we were typically stuck on lower quality codecs. And for the same amount of space, you would get something fuzzy and not that good to look at, not that useful to look at. But in 2004, DivX, actually released a codec, which was a kind of MP4 version of, of a codec, which gave the ability to have smaller file sizes and uh, higher quality. So what it meant was that you could actually store a Hollywood film on a single uh, CD, with that single CD storing about 700 meg. So you could have a full film in about 700 meg, and it would look pretty good. What that also led, meant to is that there was lots of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing programs popped up at around that time. So we ended up with things like LimeWire and BearShare and Napster, um, all of which turned up and all of which made it easier to be able to download files, download media, get hold of music and get hold of uh, of uh, films and tv programs and software so the piracy went from being a niche thing where you had to be quite tech savvy to be able to do it to be something that was easy for everybody to do um so as a, a summary for what was going on in 2004 broadband gets good our broker bank gets fast enough that it actually is, you're able to do uh, downloads of large files. Video compression gets good, so that you can make a nice quality video with a size that you can download within about a day. Writable CD-ROMs are pretty much common on computers. So you've pretty much got infinite storage because you can just store all your movies, all your downloaded TV programs on CDs, and it'd be absolutely fine. And there was a massive amount of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing that just kind of exploded 
the the tons of applications that we're doing it increased and made it just a lot easier for people to be able to download stuff and grab hold of content. What that actually led to was the the movie industry, which is the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America. They started behaving a bit like the music industry had. So what they were doing was suing people willy nilly and trying to stop the spread of their media. But they were doing it in daft ways. So this article was actually something that inspired me to go and do something else that I'll talk about. But what they were doing is that they would look at, say, the file name of a file that was being stored online, and they would assume that if it matched a film name, then that was a copy of the film. So there were cases where the movie industry was suing uh, Linux distributions, or they were seeing, suing open source software because they had a similar name to a Hollywood movie. Um, there was a frameworks, uh, Grind and Twisted, or sorry, Grind and, uh, yeah, Grind and Twisted, which had similar names to some Hollywood movies. And the websites that were hosting those Python frameworks got cease and desist. Oh, I did forget about Kazara, that's true. Um, they got cease and desist letters saying, take down this bit of software um, because it is our movie when that bit of software was kilobytes rather than the megabytes or the hundreds of megabytes that you would need in order to have a, a video online. So they were doing it kind of really, really terribly. Um, at that time, so 2004, I was writing up a project for the final of my degree. So I was finishing off and I'm sure as everybody knows, when you're trying to look at a big document and try to write a big document, anything is more interesting than actually doing the work you're supposed to be doing. So I got really interested in this. So I started thinking about ways to identify video and how to do it in a fairly efficient way so that you didn't have to rely on things that were already embedded in it. So I can't use things like file names. That's been proven to be terrible. You can't use a file size because you can't really tell movies apart or you can't tell big uh, software distributions that are Linux CDs against a movie. You can't use the metadata. You can't use anything that's been embedded into that video file because the first thing that people will do is strip it out again. So if you put the movie name in it, people are going to take it out so you can't actually see it anymore. So I was thinking we have to do something that's going to be important for the video, something that's going to be preserved and something that will still be there all the time. So what I ended up thinking about was the motion that was in the video. So what we've got on screen there is a frame from a video and where you can see the highlighted white, that is where there was motion on this video and it picked it up and it's highlighted it and it's making it to do a measure of that, that motion. Now, if you can use that motion and you can measure that motion, you can then turn that into a graph. So you can turn that into something that looks like a load of peaks and troughs. And if you can generate this data, you can use this data as a fingerprint, as a way of just identifying the video. So that's what I tried doing. Um, I got things like this. Um, I then tried it out. Uh, tried altering the video. It worked quite well. Um, I then applied for some money to try and investigate this idea a bit further. So I, I ended up asking the Scottish government. <laughs> I ended up asking the Scottish government for some money uh, and they gave me some money to actually investigate this and see if I could uh, make it better and make it faster, make it more robust. I built myself a small Beowulf cluster. So that was, I think, 32 computers, all of which cost about 500 quid each. Um, ended up employing a couple of people. And what we ended up doing was just transcoding these videos, transcoding Hollywood movies, TV shows on these computers. We would change the bit rates that films were encoding at. We would change the frame rates, the frame sizes. So go from a big frame to a small frame. We would add borders. We would add colors in. We would just 
alter it as much as possible, mess with it as much as possible, and see if it was still identifiable. See if we could still identify the video after we had messed with it a lot. Um, the other thing I also did was finish writing up and got my PhD at the same time. When we did that, um, we ended up getting these results. I'm sorry, these are terrible graphs. Um, I couldn't find the originals, so I actually ripped these graphs out of a paper that I published on this topic. Um, what it shows is the difference in the fingerprints over kind of up here. I can do uh, pointer up here. Yep. Yeah. That's if you're changing the bit rate. So if you're making the quality of the video less and less. Um, once you go down to kind of this level, it's still identifiable, but it's unwatchable. You just wouldn't bother. The invention of the MPEG-4 made that people wouldn't bother doing that anymore. Um, when you start messing with frame rates, once it gets down kind of lower than about 16 frames a second, it's not as identifiable anymore. But once you're getting down to that sort of level, it looks like a series of static images rather than looking like nice smooth video. So people generally wouldn't watch it anyway. Um, and at the bottom there, I've just shown what happens if you change the brightness, if you made it brighter or less bright. So we ended up, uh, yep, bye. we ended up with a nice, uh, robust way of identifying video. Now, that video identification method never actually ended up being used too much. But 2004 and the explosion of broadband, the explosion of piracy, effectively, did actually do some really good stuff. What it did end up doing is creating, or at least massively influencing, the movie industry to put its content online. So before the start of 2004, the movie industry was just thinking, what should happen if that people should go to the cinema, people should rent DVDs, people should have lockdown content. Whereas what actually happened was showing that people wanted to stream the content, people wanted convenience for the content. And over the subsequent 15 years or so, the industry picked that up and started doing things like Netflix and iPlayer and Hulu and Apple TV and kind of all the other systems where you can just stream video, audio, just conveniently and the way that you want to do it. Right, if there's any questions, um, feel free to ask. Uh, Alan, do you want to jump back in again? Just switching the microphone on now. Okay. So, um, some people are saying some very nice things in the comments uh, and you took us back then <laughs> down memory lane when you were talking about things like file sharing. I yep. can remember, you know, if there was a particular thing sometimes you wanted to download, you'd sort of have to leave the computer on overnight and then come down in the morning and hope it had downloaded that particular. Yeah, um, so there was, um, so with like the movies, it would be people would just download overnight. So you could do 24 hours and get a, a film. Um, it, it's people would do all sorts of things, especially with the, you know, it used to be it take ages to get an album, you know, free broadband, but it then just turned into people would download the entire TV series. Um, so they would download 24 episodes of stuff and it would take a week or two to do that. Um, and that was back in the days when there was releases of TV programs a lot uh, more common, but it released in the US first, and then the UK wouldn't get it for six months or a year. People just pirated it um, in the That's UK and just watch it whenever it turned up. I'm going to come on to a question from Gary in a moment. I, I do remember there was a particular media format, but I can't remember the name of it, but it mm -hmm. used to manage to fit a movie onto a 600 megabyte disc. Yep. And it, whatever the codec was that was used, sometimes you'd notice it was sort of strong black backgrounds, a thing that you'd see these weird kind of tiles moving in the background that, that weren't there. It was sort of like a... So that's just a... It's an encoding artifact. 
That was it, yes. Yeah, so that was MPEG-1, uh, which wasn't a great, it wasn't a great codec, or it, I suppose it was a good codec, but it wasn't as, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just answer Gary's question. I was living yeah, in Scotland. Two questions, yeah. Yeah, I, I have seen the other one, but I was living in Scotland. Uh, I did my PhD there. Um, so the, the the way codecs work, the way they encode video, is that in order to get the lower size, they have to lose some data. And when you've got kind of a strong black, when you've got a strong set of colors or maybe a gradient of color, they have to summarize that gradient. And you can see it more with dark colors than you can see with light colors. Um, it's still there in the light colors. Like behind me, there'll be gradations behind me that your eyes won't be able to pick up on uh, just because of the way your eyes work. It's nothing to do with the codec. Um, the, if I just turn the lights off, you'd be able to see, uh, well, the camera would struggle, but you'd also be able to see more of the gradation in the black colors uh, there. So I, I think we have time for one more question, and then I'm going to press, press pause or stop on the recording, and, and then okay. after that, we can have like an open mic. So the final question would be, it was Gary's one. Gary's keen to know, was the, the strategy system, the design you came up with, was it taken any further? Right. <laughs> no, the answer. <laughs> yeah, you do, yeah. So, um, no, is the answer. Um, I've got a number of patents out of it. So there's a number of patents, and we tried selling the technology in order to, well, we first started trying to sell the technology to lots of different places. We actually talked to the movie industry, MPAA. We entered a competition uh, because mid-2000s, they were trying to work out what do we do with all this piracy because uh, they were still doing the daft ways of, of dealing with it. And we did really well in the competition. They just didn't take up any of the technologies uh, that had actually been submitted. They ended up deciding that it wasn't worth it um, and they were going to go a different way. They ended up with different methods of doing it. There are still companies that do piracy detection. Um, so there are a number of companies that do have, that do scour peer-to-peer -peer networks, that do scour all sorts of things and look to see um, what is being uh, downloaded, what films are being done. But they're a lot less heavy-handed now, at least when they're you know, contacting people and taking legal action because it's, they basically made it a PR disaster in the mid-2000s when they were doing it, uh, when the movie industry and the music industry were doing it. So they actually care more about live events. They go more after people who are doing things like uh, restreaming live streams of sports. So when you actually get a sports event stream to you, uh, some places will embed stuff into that sports event video stream so that when you restream it, or if you restream it, they can detect whose stream it was that was being restreamed so they know who to go after legally in order to, to take that down. But right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to press the stop on the recording. And let me just do that first of all.